section, we'll look at more advanced theory relating to infrared spectroscopy, and we'll seek to understand and rationalize why groups absorb in different positions and with different intensities. So what we'll focus on first is looking to understand why different bonds absorb at different frequencies. So we'll be looking to understand why carbon hydrogen bonds absorb down here at 3000 wave numbers, whereas carbon oxygen double bonds absorb all the way up here at, seven, at around 1700 wave numbers. Now after this, we'll look at why different functional groups give different intensities in the infrared spectrum. But first, we'll look at the difference in frequency. OK, so to try and understand why different functional groups vibrate in different regions, we're going to have a look at some basic maths. Now, you don't need to recall this. I just want to show you that there is a physical basis for why different vibrations occur in the regions that they do. So first, we're going to look at Hooke's law for a simple harmonic oscillator. Now, here we have frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi times by the root of spring stiffness divided by mass. Now, if we get rid of the variables, we get frequency as related to spring stiffness divided by mass. And we can convert this into words to make it a little easier to see. And then we can convert this so that it is suitable for infrared spectroscopy. What this tells us is that the frequency of the bond vibration is related to the bond's strength divided by the atomic weight of the atoms either side of the bond. Now, what this means is that when we have a stiffer spring, so we have a higher bond strength, we get our vibrations at a higher frequency or higher wave number. When we have a lower bond strength, so this might be a single bond instead of a double or a triple, we will get our vibrations at a lower frequency or lower wave number. Now, this also relates to atomic weight. So when we have a higher mass, we will lower the frequency of the expected vibration. So when the atoms at either side of the bond are both heavier, um, we will shift our vibration to the right-hand side of the infrared spectrum. And when the one of the atoms is lighter than the other, we'll shift it over to the left-hand side, to the higher frequency region. So this equation tells us that there is a direct relationship between Hooke's law and where vibrational frequencies will occur in the infrared spectrum. Now here we can see um, some examples of bonds that would be infrared active. So if we take the equation, frequency of infrared absorbed is equal to bond strength divided by atomic weight, we can predict what would happen to the, stre to the frequencies that we would observe for each of these three cases on the left. So here we have a series of three um, environments. So we have a carbon atom here, say, bound to another atom. And this could be carbon bound to hydrogen, carbon bound to carbon, and carbon bound to sulfur, for example. And as our mass increases on the left-hand side, the frequency or wave number of the vibration will decrease. So it'll be moved to the right-hand side of the infrared spectrum. Now, if we have a look at atoms with different stiffness of springs or different bond strengths, um, what we get is we have single bonds, double bonds, and of course, triple bonds, that as our bond strength increases, the frequency or wave number of the vibration also increases. And so without going into really complex maths, we can see that there is a physical basis for why vibrations occur in different reasons. And we can start to rationalize why these vibrations occur in those regions relative to each other. Now, if we have a look at the infrared spectrum, we can see this effect in action. So on the left hand side of the infrared spectrum, we have bonds between reasonably heavy atoms and hydrogen. So we have a very large mass differential. So we have carbon hydrogen, oxygen hydrogen and nitrogen hydrogen bonds over here. Now, because of this large mass difference, we get the vibrations occurring at a high frequency or high wave number section of the infrared spectrum. So these bonds are very good at absorbing high energy or high frequency light. 
Now, if we move over to the right, we can see that here we have our triple bonds. So here we have carbon-carbon and carbon-nitrogen triple bonds. Now, if we look further to the right, we can see that we have the triple bonds in the high frequency region, the double bonds in a slightly lower frequency region, and the single bonds where you have two heavy atoms on either side of the bond are shifted into the fingerprint region. So into the really low frequency, low wave number region. So this explains what this allows us to see that the stiffness of the bond or the strength of the bond is also important for the um, for the position that you see it, that you see the vibration within the infrared spectrum. Now in this region we have our double bonded species. So we have carbon oxygen, carbon nitrogen, carbon carbon and nitrogen oxygen double bonds here. And you can see that these are perfectly between the single bonded vibrations and the triple bond vibrations as well. And so hopefully that explains how we can understand why different functional groups vibrate in different regions. So it helps us to rationalize the frequency of the vibration that we see. But what about trying to understand the intensity of the, of the um, peak in the infrared spectrum? So looking at this infrared spectrum for this molecule here, we have eight carbon hydrogen um, groups on this molecule. So eight carbon hydrogen bonds. We have one here, one here, so three, four, five, and then we have a CH3 group here. So that is eight. And yet on the infrared spectrum, we only have a very, very small um, absorbance. However, here we have a single carbon oxygen double bond. And this peak at 1710 wave numbers is the peak from that bond. Now there is only one vibration here, yet the peak is many, many times the size of the peak at 3000 wave numbers. So why is this? Well, this is related to the change in dipole moment of the vibrating bond. So essentially, the bigger the change in dipole moment as the bond vibrates, the larger the absorbance will be. Now, highly polar groups such as carbon oxygen double bonds, nitrogen oxygen double bonds and oxygen hydrogen single bonds absorb very, very strongly because they get a much larger change in dipole when the bond is excited. Now, this is one reason why infrared spectroscopy is very good for functional group identification. Now, we can see this in action for ethanol. So here we have a single OH bond in the ethanol, and it gives a very, very large peak here. But we have five carbon hydrogen bonds um, also present in ethanol, and the peak is much, much smaller than the oxygen hydrogen. That's because of the change in dipole moment for the carbon hydrogen bonds is much smaller than that for the oxygen hydrogen. So here we can see that very large absorption band for the OH group and much smaller absorption band for the five CH bonds in the molecule, even though there's five times as many of those bonds than they are of OH groups. The electronegativity of the atoms either side of the bond that we're interested in can also strongly affect the signal intensity that you see in the infrared spectrum. Now, to explain this, we're going to go through these two infrared spectra that is shown here and here, and we're going to try and match them up with the two molecules on the left and the right. So we have a terminal alkyne on the left, which contains a carbon-carbon triple bond and a carbon-hydrogen single bond. And on the right, we have our nitrile, which only contains a carbon-nitrogen triple bond. Now, to start with, we need to think, where will these groups absorb? Well, carbon-nitrogen triple bonds and carbon-carbon triple bonds absorb in the same region of the spectrum. So they absorb here, between 2000 and 2400 wave numbers. So what we can see in both of these spectra are a peak. So we have a smaller peak on the top um, spectrum and a larger peak on the bottom spectrum. So we need to consider these functional groups a bit more to work out which spectrum belongs to which. Now, we know that when you have an alkyne group, you have two carbons either side of this triple bond. Now, those carbon atoms have an equal electronegativity. They are just as electronegative as each other. 
And what this means is that when they vibrate, there is a very small change in dipole moment, which leads to a very small peak on the infrared spectrum. Now, a nitrile group has a larger difference in electronegativity between the carbon and the nitrogen, and so we would expect a much larger peak on the infrared spectrum. So from first glance, it looks like this infrared spectrum at the top corresponds to the alkyne, and this one at the bottom corresponds to the nitrile. So how can we confirm this? Well, the alkyne also contains an additional carbon-hydrogen bond at the end of the alkyne. So this carbon here has three bonds used for the triple bond, and it has one extra which it uses to have a hydrogen. Now, this carbon-hydrogen in a terminal alkyne actually gives a very large signal intensity above 3000 wave numbers, and we can see this in the top graph in the top spectrum here. Now, in this region of the infrared spectrum, we would only expect to see OH groups, NH, and NH2 groups, but we also see the carbon hydrogen bond of a terminal alkyne. This is the only time when a carbon hydrogen bond gives an absorbance above 3100 wave numbers. And so it really is diagnostic for that terminal alkyne. There is no absorbance in the lower spectrum, so that means that we can say for definite that the top spectrum is for the alkyne and the bottom spectrum is for the nitrile. So what do we want to differentiate between different kinds of alkynes? Well, on the left, we have a symmetrical alkyne. So we have an alkyne in the middle of this chain. The chain is the same length on both sides and the molecule contains a plane of symmetry. So if we were to place a mirror down the center of this molecule, down the center of the carbon carbon triple bond, we would see it reflected in that mirror. We have an alkyne where the alkyne is closer to one end of the chain than the other. And we also have a terminal alkyne. Now, the position of the infrared spectrum that we're interested in is this region here between 2000 and 2400 wave numbers. And what we can see is that the top spectrum contains no peak, the middle spectrum contains a very small peak, and the bottom spectrum contains a larger peak. So why does this happen? Well, this alkyne is symmetric. And what this means is that if this were to vibrate, you would get no difference in dipole moment. There is no difference in atom polarity at either side of this bond. You have the same groups present. There's no difference in electronegativity between the atoms here or here because they are both carbon atoms. And therefore, when this molecule vibrates, you get no change in the dipole. You get no movement of the dipole, which means that you get no absorbance in the infrared spectrum at this region. Now, if we move down to look at the alkyne here, where we have a difference in the number of carbon atoms on either side of this alkyne, um, this difference um, is enough to allow this to get a very, very small dipole moment when it's excited by infrared light and vibrates. And we can see this reflecting the very, very small peak here. Now, both sides of the alkyne contain only carbon and hydrogen. They contain carbon-hydrogen single bonds. And so there's no difference in the electronegativity. At either side of the molecule. However, because you have very, you have different masses on each side of the molecule, you can still get a very, very small change in dipole moment as this bond vibrates. And this explains why you have a very, very small peak in the infrared spectrum, but it's a peak that's almost invisible. Now, if we move down to have a look at the terminal alkyne, on one side you have a CH group, and on the other side, here you have a CH2 group and the rest of the chain. Now this difference is large enough that when the molecule, when the bond vibrates, you will get a larger movement in the dipole moment. And this means that you get a larger peak on the infrared spectrum. Now this is still weaker than if we had something like a carbon oxygen double bond, for example, but it's still enough to give us a reasonable size peak on the infrared spectrum. And so it's not only the strength of the bond and the electronegativity 
um, of the groups either side of the bond that make a difference, but it's also the symmetry of the molecule. If we have a, um, a bond where you have exactly the same functional groups on either side, this can mean that that particular vibration is no longer infrared active and we won't see it on an infrared spectrum. Now this is a really rare example of this phenomenon, but it does happen and it, you should be aware that it can happen when you're looking at different compounds. So in summary, the intensity of peaks in the infrared spectrum shifts according to the change in dipole moment observed for each vibration. Changing the bond's strength or stiffness or the masses of atoms either side of the bond will change the position of the absorbance in the infrared spectrum. Changing the difference in electronegativity between two atoms either side of a bond will affect the intensity of absorbance within the infrared spectrum. And in rare cases, you may see that vibrations won't be infrared active due to symmetry of the molecule around the functional group that you are interested in. We will now look at different methods of making samples for infrared spectroscopy.